Good morning. I'd like to invite you to stand at this time if you're able, if you would like to follow along in your hymnal. Our first song this morning is going to be on page 335, but of course it will also be up on the screen, Standing on the Promises. great help this week from a seven-year-old child who knew that that could be helpful, but it was. Um, so we are super ready for your kids to be here for the superheroes theme Bible school that will start tomorrow night at six o'clock. We go Monday through Thursday. The program's over at eight. Supper is served at 530. If you have not signed up, whatever child that happens to roam around in your world, please do so today so that I know they'll be here and we can have the right the right mix of kids in the right spaces. Um, I still could use a couple more um, adults to be in this space with the kids kind of when they're at the big table. So if you haven't plugged in to do anything else, come and sit at a table and talk to some kids for a couple hours um, next week. We'd love to have you. There's also an adult Bible study that will happen from 6.30 to 7.30. So you can kind of plug in in the early part for some stuff. Go to Bible study and come back and be in the room for our worship service at the end. So it's going to be a very exciting week. Um, we are going to make some allowances for the weather, I hope. Uh, we're going to try and use the pavilion. If that doesn't work, we'll find another, another option. But recreation, honestly, it's like 30 minutes. And it's in the evening. So well, hopefully we're going to be fine. We'll have water out there and things like that. Um, Moments of hope. That big signboard is gone because you guys took all the stickies off of it. So it was of no use anymore. So please, by the 3rd of July, bring back whatever sticky note thing you promised to bring. So we'll have that for the, uh, to build that meal on July the 6th. And just be in prayer for those folks that we, we do manage to touch and reach out to on that day. Um, many of them are homeless, I would say, or in halfway houses and things like that. So they just don't have permanent uh, places to live for the most part. Um, it is in this time of year, it is just really hard for them because it's so, so hot. So just kind of keep them on the top of your prayer list. Today's the last day to order the new Broadus shirts. They're out there on the rack. This is, this is the day. So before you leave today, if you are wanting to get one of those, 
grab the uh, order form and get that in the box. No money is required to order. There is money required to take them home. So <laughs> it's a pay for them before you take possession. Um, last thing I want to mention is the Broadest Classics trip, because that's September, but we do need to, to lock down the bus and lock down how much people have to pay. So if you're still kind of on the fence about that, we need to get a form in make the application, and if cost is the problem, the thing that's kind of preventing you from going, we do have some scholarship money. We have a nice nest egg of scholarship money that's been given by others so that you can go. The other component is that we get enough to go that we can pay the lower rate, everyone gets a better deal, okay? So if you're still kind of, eh, I'm not sure if I wanna go or I'm not sure if I can afford to go, fill out your application and write on there, need scholarship help need financial help, and we'll figure it out for you, okay? Um, I feel like I've forgotten something, but you know what? The Lord will remind us of it later, right? Let's go into worship tonight, today, and just kind of settle into this. It's going to be an exciting week, but it is now it's time to, uh, to focus on the Lord and pray and uh, worship Him. Father God, we do thank you. I know I'm just like buzzing like a bee right now because you have placed this wonderful ministry in front of me uh, for me to lead. And I just thank you for that. I just um, continue to lift me up, give me strength. Um, don't usually pray for myself, but that's what I need right now is to know that I'm in the right place doing the right thing. Father God, we love you so much. Help us to, um, to listen to the words of the music today and to sing them from our hearts. Let them change us. Let them move us in a new direction where we can be of more service to you. Lord, we love you. We want to uh, lift up those that we know who can't be here because of a physical injury or um, an illness. We also want to lift up our friends in the moments of hope ministry and others who are maybe suffering from all of the heat that we're having. Father, we love you. We know that you are here. Help us to hear you today. Help it to make a difference. Help it to move us in a new direction to be more like your son. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite you to stand one more time.
children to come on up here. Got something colorful I want to show you this morning. Ah, good to see you. May I have to scoot down this way a little bit? How come all the kids are on this side? How'd that happen? That's okay. Oh, nice group today. Good to see you. you guys enjoying the summer? Yeah. A little bit warm? Yeah, a little bit warm. All right. Can y'all scoot a little bit one way or the other? Just make a little space. There you go. Very good. Okay. Want to show you this. Do you know what these are? They look like big cherries, don't they? You know, they're not big cherries. They're small plums. These are small, kind of wild plums. Many years ago, it may have been 15 years ago or something, my wife Amber gave me a plum tree that we planted in our backyard. And it has delicious little little plums. Well, it took a while to kind of grow up, you know, to, to where it made fruit. And then we had lots of fruit. I mean, thousands of plums. We made jellies. We made cobblers, all sorts of stuff for a couple of years. And then you know what happened? No plums. It just stopped making plums. And I, every spring I'd go out and say, where are the plums? And maybe I'd get two or three, but not very many. So... A few times I said to myself, I might as well just cut that down. It's just using up space in the backyard, and I don't have a big backyard. Um, so I'm just going to cut the plum down. But my daughter, Kara, she likes to hang her hammock on that tree. So she said, don't cut the tree down. So I didn't. And then, lo and behold, and it is a mystery to me, this year, plums, hundreds of plums. And, and so I was like, wow, this is so cool. I wonder if it'll, it'll happen again. Uh, next year, and I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to give you a plum right now. If you want one after the service, they're kind of messy. Come see me out front, and you can have one if you want to see what they taste like. They're kind of tart and sweet. But it reminded me of a, of a story in, in the Bible that, that Jesus told. And he said, uh, it said, Jesus told this parable. He said, a man had a fig tree. So this wasn't plums, this was figs. He had a fig tree planted in a, in a garden or in a vineyard, and he went out to look for fruit on it, but he didn't find any. And so he said to the man who took care of the garden, so kind of the gardener, he said, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should, I, why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it, and I'll fertilize it, and if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Now, it might be kind of hard to see what lesson Jesus was trying to teach. Really, he was trying to teach us that God is patient with us because everybody's not perfect all the time. Are we perfect? Okay, so... You know, we need God to have a little patience with us. We need our parents and our friends and family to have, have patience with us because sometimes we make mistakes. Um, but this is saying that, you know, God is going to judge people, but he gives people chances. And he sent Jesus into the world so people would know about love and so that they could, uh, they could find that new life in, in Jesus. So patience is, is very important for us to have with other people. So when the Bible talks about that we need to have patience, it's usually not talking about you know, patience when you're sitting at a red light. Of course, they didn't have a red light back in Bible times, did they? No, not yet. But it's really patience with people. 
Because sometimes people let us down, sometimes they disappoint us, sometimes they hurt our feelings. And either we can say, well, that person said something mean to me, I'm never talking to them again. Or we can say, you know, maybe they're having a bad day. I'm going to be patient, I'm going to be kind to them, and I bet, you, you know, I bet that this isn't, they're all, not always going to be like that. And so we learn to have patience with people and give people second chances. Do y'all know who Thomas Edison is? He was a scientist who, who discovered how to put together a light bulb. So we use light bulbs all the time now, but he, he was making the first ones. And there's a story about him that said he had a group of people who worked with him, and it took them like all day to put together one light bulb. But they wanted to test it, so they worked all day, and they got one light bulb that they could test, and they, they tested it in the lab upstairs. And so he had a young boy who was helping there, and he gave it to the young boy and said, you know, take this up upstairs to be tested. Can you guess what happened? Oh, he tried, but he tripped, and he fell, and he broke it. So they had to start over. Another day, they had to work to get another light bulb. And the next day, do you think Thomas Edison gave it to that boy? He did. Because he knew that the, you know, the boy, he didn't want to break the boy's spirit. He didn't want the boy to feel bad, like, you know, just because he had tripped. And so he showed that he was having patience with him and that he trusted him. And he gave him and let him carry that second light bulb. Well, sometimes we have to be like that with, with people as well. And it makes people feel good. It helps them to, you know, to trust themselves. And besides, people have been patient with us. And God has been patient with us. So that's what, what we need to do. And so uh, we're going to pray that God will help us to grow in our patience with people. That we would give them second chances and help them to, to, to be their best. And we're also going to thank God for having patience with us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I... I know living in this world, sometimes people can get on our nerves, whether it's a brother or a sister, but even a friend or a classmate. And I just pray, Lord, that you would teach us to be forgiving, to be kind, and to be patient with people, knowing that people can grow and they can change and do better. And so we thank you for loving us and forgiving us and having patience with us. Help us to do the same. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may go back with your families, and after the service, if you want to come find me, I'll, I'll give you a plum.
fathoms deep Your grace is more Where grace is found Is where you are And where you are Lord, I am free This holy name All right, I've popped a cough drop in my cheek now, so maybe y'all won't have to have patience with me this morning as I cough through the, through the sermon. Um, interruptions, that's kind of our theme for the next few weeks. Uh, everybody lives a life full of interruptions. I would say, as little children, long before we learn to uh, make a schedule for our day or fill out things on a daily planner, we learned what it was to be interrupted. Because somebody would come in and change the, uh, the TV station while we're watching cartoons or, or right when we're you know, getting ready to go on a bike ride, mom will call us to come in for lunch. And so, you know, we just, we realize life is full of interruptions. And we, we always have those. As we get older, we find that some interruptions are, are a little more consequential and maybe even more annoying to us than they were when we were young. And you might think that a life without interruptions, <clears throat> a life without the unscheduled phone calls and technical glitches and mechanical breakdowns or even an encounter with an irate neighbor, you would think, oh, if I didn't have any of those interruptions in my life, it would be, it would be heaven. But I have a premise that without interruptions, life would be pretty boring and unfulfilling. And the reason is that God's plans are not always our plans. Our timing is not always God's timing. Our priorities are not always his priorities. And so sometimes God himself has to interrupt us. Proverbs 19 verse 21 says this, Many are the plans of a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. Therefore, following the example of Jesus, we need to be open to the idea that not all interruptions are bad. Some might even come directly from the Heavenly Father. And so it's best that we see interruptions as opportunities. 
I guess that it's important for us to give some sort of definition to this word interruption. It comes to us in English from the Latin, a compound word of inter, which means between, and rumper, which means to rupture or to break something. So an interruption is something that comes after you've made a plan or after you have started a venture, uh, but before you've completed it, something messes it up. Something changes the plan. Something breaks in to disrupt it or break it apart. And so by that definition, if I'm standing out in the commons after the worship service and you come and you tap me on the shoulder to say hi or perhaps you have a prayer request that you want to share, that's not an interruption. I'm there for that purpose. You know, so, but on the other hand, if you see me grocery shopping in Kroger and you tap me on the shoulder to talk, technically you could say, well, that's an interruption because I was in Kroger for a different purpose, to do my grocery shopping, and at least for a moment, maybe you've changed those plans. Now, before you think of me as very standoffish and get scared to tap me on the shoulder in Kroger, let me just tell you, we learn to appreciate those kind of interruptions. I'd be happy to see you, happy to talk to you. I do it to other people all the time. And if you come up and get my attention in, in Kroger, that's probably the, the most enjoyable part of my grocery shopping trip, right there, to talk to you. And if I'm really too busy to give you five minutes of conversation, I'll tell you that. That's not going to happen often, but it could. Now, I realize that we would hardly call bumping into each other in the grocery store an interruption. Because we tend to save that word for more serious breaks in our scheduling. Indeed, there are some interruptions that can be bad. They can be detrimental um, and, and you know, set us behind or, or, or whatever it is. But we shouldn't automatically assume that an interruption is bad. We should ask ourselves... Is there something good that can come from this break in what I had planned or this delay? Is God presenting me with some sort of opportunity? We need some di divine discernment for that. It's also good that we be reminded that while people might interrupt us, people are not interruptions. I, you may say semantic, no. People are God's children. They're important. So yes, they can, they can derail our plans. Yes, they might even annoy us or, do, or say something mean to us. But they themselves are not interruptions. So we see that particularly in the Gospel of March. Uh, March, of Mark. <laughs> Y'all missed that Gospel of March, didn't you? It, it, it's that much of Jesus' ministry actually revolves around how he handled interruptions. Somebody I was reading said that, that they counted 35 of them in the Gospel of Mark. I didn't go back to verify that. But these are cases when the scripture tells us specifically that Jesus was doing something or going somewhere, but something or someone popped up in between to break or to reroute those, those plans. Now, invariably, Jesus used the interruption as an opportunity to do something or to teach something that would glorify God. So what I want us to do is to pull out several examples today in the coming weeks to, to seek uh, to see them, seeking the wisdom that will help us better interpret interruptions as opportunities. Moving up more or less chronologically in the Gospel of Mark, we're going to start in chapter 1. So if you have your Bible or you just want to look at it on the screen with me, I'm going to read for you uh, from Mark chapter 1 starting at verse 21. It says, they, this is Jesus and, and the few disciples that he had called at that point early in the ministry, it says, they went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, 
because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. But then a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. And the people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Now, early in Jesus' ministry, it was not unusual for him to go into a local synagogue and to, to have a chance to speak. I mean, he was a young, up-and-coming rabbi. Uh, they, they were anxious for that. Capernaum seems to have been one of the places that Jesus visited most frequently. A lot of his friends and, and even disciples were, were from there. It was a town on the north uh, coast of the Sea of Galilee, about 30 or 40 miles away from Jesus' hometown of Nazareth. Now, remember that synagogues were a little different than the temple, the one temple in Jerusalem, because almost every town of any size had a synagogue, a place where the Jewish men could, could gather and hear the, the scripture and have uh, worship and, and teaching times together. Now, in the temple, you had to have a priest. A priest who would uh, do the rituals and the animal sacrifices, but you didn't have to have that in a synagogue. But a synagogue would have a leader, um, and, and that leader would be able to choose other men who would read the scripture for the day, or lead a prayer, or even to get up and to, to preach and to teach. So on a certain Sabbath, Jesus was there in Capernaum teaching and, and preaching. And we don't know what he was speaking about. We're not told that. But we do know that people were amazed by him. Rather than it coming across as a performance or as a perfunctory ritual, his words were really touching their hearts. Perhaps he was opening their eyes to the work of the kingdom of God all around them. <clears throat> Above all, what they recognized was that he spoke with authority. He was someone who knew firsthand what he was talking about. He was somebody who had experienced and was demonstrating the power of God. Now, I'm just going to tell you, tell you that preachers everywhere long for that moment that the congregation is fully engaged. And on that day, Jesus had them in the palm of his hand. And then came the interruption. Seemingly, in the middle of his sermon, some strange fellow hopped up and began yelling at Jesus. And I'm just going to take a little aside here to say thank you. Thank you for not doing that on Sunday mornings. I know many of you leave here from time to time wanting to yell at me, but you save it for later. Good etiquette. Thank you for that. But this, pa this passage tells us something that Jesus understood that probably most of the other people didn't. That man was under the possession or the influence of what the, the Greek calls there an unclean or an evil spirit. Now, I readily admit that I don't have a lot of knowledge or experience when it comes to demon possession. Most understanding comes from the biblical stories such as this. Like some of you, I, I've been in places where the influence of, of Satan seemed particularly pervasive, so I don't deny that the world is full of spiritual warfare. But I don't always know the line between demonic influence and demonic possession. And neither do I always know whether something is demonic or is it a mental illness or some other physiological uh, condition or response? So I try to approach these situations with, with humility. And I would encourage you to do the same. And I would just say to you in your daily life, calling someone demon-possessed without divine 
uh, insight on the matter, it can be really harmful and unkind. So don't let that be your first assumption when somebody's acting strange. But what we see in this story is a familiar refrain. Jesus has the discernment to know what's going on. The man called Jesus by name, Jesus of Nazareth. And then he accused him of wanting to bring destruction upon them. It had to be a little bit disturbing or disruptive for, for Jesus, a little disconcerting for his listeners, but this really wasn't unusual. What we see in the scripture is that unclean spirits could indeed recognize Jesus. The demonic recognizes that which is holy and hates it and is afraid of it. James 2 verse 19, James, the brother of Jesus, is talking to Christians and he says, you believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Now, in Mark chapter 5, we have the story of the possessed man who calls himself Legion. Uh, and, and he came running through a graveyard from the tombstones towards Jesus. And he cried out, what do you want from me, Jesus, son of the most high God? We flip on further into Acts chapter 16 when Paul and Silas were in Philippi. And there's a young girl who... Uh, has a, an unclean spirit of divination. And she's following around Paul and Silas, crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God. Now, in each of these cases, the voice within the person, the, the, the unclean spirit, speaks the truth. But it's pretty evident that it wasn't spoken to glorify God. In fact, the demonic intent was probably to disrupt the work of God with confusion. Now, in the case of Jesus in the synagogue, it could be that most of those present <clears throat> just thought, uh, there's crazy Joe from down the block. You know, he's always saying crazy things, always hurting people's feelings or whatever. Or perhaps they thought that he was drunk or perhaps I just thought he was very rude and inappropriate for a Saturday morning Sabbath gathering. But Jesus understood that the interruption was an opportunity to look beneath the surface of this man's behavior. So here's something to keep in mind when people break into your well-planned life, when they disturb your peace, and when they muddle your schedule. Interruptions can be annoying to us, but they may also give us, give us an opportunity to delve beneath the surface of a person's behavior. Of course, I'm not talking here about saying hello in the supermarket, but in cases where the interruption is thoughtless, rude, even malicious, or quite frankly, if someone says, hi, and you respond, hi, how are you doing? And they hang their head and they say, okay, I guess. You know, that's a signal that something else is going on in their life. Something that's not yet been spoken or defined. When I was a little kid, I, I had a little white dog by the name of Daisy. And in time, Daisy had, strangely enough, one puppy. And after, what, six, eight, ten weeks, whatever it is, that puppy got given away um, you know, to another family who wanted a, a, a pet. And not long after that, Daisy died. And my young heart was broken. I could easily cry without any provocation after Daisy died. And then one day I saw those neighbors just in the community and I made a point to go up to them, which I didn't normally do. I went up to them and I, I asked them how the puppy was doing. And they said, oh, yeah, puppy's doing fine. And they were very politely polite, and they asked, well, how is Daisy? And then I poured out my heart to them of my sorrow at losing Daisy. I'm just going to say I, I gave them more than they were expecting when they <laughs> asked that, that question. But they were very kind, and they listened, and they consoled me, and they invited me to come over and visit the puppy whenever I wanted. 
And really, that's all in the world I wanted. I just didn't walk up to them and say, my dog died. I, I brought up some other conversation, but I wanted them to ask. I wanted to be able to pour out my heart. And just having some of that consolation and a listening ear, it felt good because they were willing to dig a little bit deeper. So keep in mind that with most acquaintances, we only see the tip of the iceberg as far as what's going on in their lives. There's a lot more under the surface. And sometimes God calls us to explore there a little bit in order that we can come to know them. That's where the real relationships are, are built. That's where real growth and sometimes real healing can take place. So Jesus could have said to this man, sit down and be quiet. Or would somebody please escort him out until he sobers up? And you know, that would have taken care of, of the what? The guy had interrupted his sermon, it would have stopped that. But instead, Jesus decided to delve beneath the surface. So keep in mind then that why people do what they do is often more important than what they do. Does that make sense? Why people do what they do is more important than what they do. Sometimes with children, we call it acting out. Trying to get attention. You say, well, well why? What's, you know, what's going on uh, that this child would misbehave in this manner? Now, Jesus being Jesus, he didn't have to do a lot of guessing about what was going on in this man's life. Jesus knew that the voice interrupting him did not reflect the child of God who was inside. The man himself wasn't crazy. He wasn't rude. He wasn't confrontational. He wasn't drunk. In fact, we might say that that man wasn't even really himself at that moment. He was living his life under the influence of a destructive power, and Jesus recognized it. His interruption of Jesus' sermon was hardly the most important issue of the day. That's just the what. What really mattered was why. And the adversary, by the way, the, the name Satan, or from the Hebrew, Hasatan, it means the enemy or the adversary. And so the adversary of God and man was trying to bring this fellow down. Well, sympathy is a wonderful attribute. It gives us an, an understanding and, a, and a, a feeling towards another person. But empathy is even deeper. Going the step of feeling what another person feels. And the Apostle Paul understood this when in, in Romans 12, verse 15, he says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep or mourn with those who mourn. You've heard the old adage about don't judge a person until you've walked a mile in their shoes. Well, Jesus seemed to be blessed with some instant understanding here. But for us, spending a little time with a person is really only the way, only way to determine why they act as they do. Why are they disrupting my life? Why are they interrupting me? Why are they acting out? A person who is kind and, and a loyal friend, one day they snap at you. They say something mean. Well, you might assume that after all these years, all of a sudden, they become a jerk. Or you could patiently seek the why. Has something happened in their family life? Have they just gotten bad medical news? Have maybe you done something inadvertently to hurt their feelings? Have they just been handed a pink slip at work? You want to think about those things. If someone is persistent to get your attention, just, just keeps talking to you, keeps tapping you on the shoulder, maybe it's actually something good. Maybe they've had something great happen in their life and they just want to talk to someone about it. Find this out. It's a good idea with interruptions or just with our daily life in general to cut people a little bit of slack. Have the patience and the persistence to seek out why they say what they say and why they do the things they do. 
because God often then opens up a door to Christ-like ministry. So interruptions will sometimes give you the opportunity to address a person's greatest need. Maybe not the one they've mentioned to you, but what's really going on in their lives, and it opens up that door that you can turn them toward Jesus. In Jesus' circumstance there in Mark 1, the man didn't need a shusher, <clears throat> someone just to tell him, be quiet. And he didn't need a lecture about proper etiquette in the synagogue. He needed to be freed from the unhealthy power that had imprisoned him in his own body. The unclean spirit needed to submit to the power of Jesus. <clears throat> and the man within needed to feel the love of Jesus. Jesus told that, that distracting voice to be quiet. And he instructed the unclean spirit to come out of the man. <clears throat> I'll just say here, it didn't come out easily. It threw the man into a convulsion and then he, he shrieked, but then it was over. And we're not given any more details about what happened with this man. But we can assume, kind of like it's, it's told about the prodigal son, that he came to himself. All of a sudden, he was who he was supposed to be. I don't know if he even understood what had happened to him, but I like to think he listened to the rest of Jesus' sermon very intently. I like to think he loved Jesus for the rest of his life. Now, in the course of a day, you will likely face numerous interruptions. They're not all going to indicate some urgent need in a person's life. But from time to time, they will. It's unlikely that the person you need is, meet is going to be a demon-possessed person who has interrupted your sermon. That's unlikely. But it might be someone struggling with addiction. It might be someone with depression or anger issues or low self-esteem. And all of these kinds of emotional or physiological traumas can affect a person's behavior and become like shackles that imprison them in a broken life that they do not want. But the Bible speaks to how Jesus offers help and hope in every circumstance. It speaks to how his love and his compassion and his words of truth set a person free. And who knows, maybe God has chosen you to be his listening ear that day or to be his hands of help and healing. Maybe he has chosen you to speak words of wisdom and compassion. The crowd around Jesus was amazed at his teaching, but then they were even more amazed at the way he handled the interruption. Well, people are also watching us to see how we're going to handle those unscheduled moments in life. In order to represent Christ in this world, I urge you to be patient with people, even when they've disturbed you or annoyed you. Remember that people may interrupt you even inappropriately, but they themselves are not interruptions. They are children of God. And as the Holy Spirit leads, get to know them by digging a little deeper. Listen not just to what they say, but to how they say it. Seek out the why, the motivating factors behind their words and their actions. By doing that, the door may open for you to be part of the solution of the problems they're facing, part of the healing process for their brokenness. And that happens as you turn them to the Savior, Jesus Christ. Disguised as it may be, an interruption may be the opportunity that God lays before you this week. I hope you make the most of it when it comes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I am convinced that we miss so much. We miss so many of the opportunities that you put before us because we get focused on our plans. 
but help us to have a kind and discerning spirit. Help us to be there for folks that need a listening ear or maybe some words of wisdom. And Lord, give us the opportunity to point people to Jesus so that they can find healing, so that they can find forgiveness, so that they can find a transformation and a new strength that comes through, through that new birth offered through your grace and your power. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close our service today singing the, the hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. If you're using the hymn book, it's 334. And uh, as we sing, let this be a, a, a prayer of, of praise, but also just a prayer to God for his help through the difficult times of life. And if the Lord lays on your heart a decision about Jesus or about your relationship with this church that you want to, to share, uh, I'll be here at the front. You're welcome to come and speak with me. Let's stand and sing together. opportunity for you. We're going to need to move some furniture in here before we go home. We're going to leave four rows in the back, but most of the chairs are going over there in the corner. If you can help, please stay. If you don't want to, please leave, okay? <laughs> so we don't run into you with the chairs. Thank you so much. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be together this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you, to exalt your name on high. Thank you for today's message and help us to pause throughout our week because maybe you have someone that we need to talk to, someone that we need to share the gospel with. Thank you, Lord. It's in your name we pray.